Hi, I'm Chris Holbert and welcome to my screencast. Today we're going through lesson four in the clock section of the Swift Education curriculum. To find this, go to swifteducation.github.io, go to teaching app development with Swift, go down to level two, clock, and we are doing lesson four today. Today we're going to be talking about NS Notification Center, which is a way that is used to signal events throughout your app from one class to another. To start off, I'll uh, go through a this presentation here. And here we are. Notifications are basically a way of letting parts of your app talk to other parts of your app. And there are also many parts of iOS that send notifications out of the box that you can listen to. So the way the world works is that you don't really want to constantly harass people to tell you updates of information. You just want to sit back and wait for someone to tell you when something new happens. iOS has the same concept. You don't want to be constantly polling people saying, hey, have you got any news for me? For instance, my neighbor is building his house. He doesn't want to be constantly nagging the builder and saying, any progress, any progress? Rather, he's got me sending him notifications. In other words, I send him a picture of updates whenever there's anything he might be interested in seeing. That's a perfect microcosm of how notifications work. Here's a bunch of built-in iOS notifications that you can listen to. The app has become active. The device has rotated. It has changed location, out of memory, and so on and so forth. Now, observers are people that listen for notifications. Any class can be an observer. All you need to do is tell NS Notification Center that you are interested in a particular notification, and voila, you are now an observer. So here's an example. Your app can talk to the NS Notification Center and say, tell me when the device rotates. And you'll get a, uh, get a message whenever that happens. Now the observer pattern is a popular software design pattern that has been used in many languages in many ways to basically let what parts of the app talk to other parts of apps. In iOS, NS notifications are a popular way of doing this. However, let it also be said that NS notifications can be overused, so beware. This is what it looks like to get a um, observer to ask the notification center to be observed, to be notified whenever something has changed. Basically, you ask the NS notification for its default center, and then call a method called add observer. And you generally pass in yourself as the observing object. You pass in the name of the method to be called in this selector here. You ask for the name of the notification, and you can ask the specific object that you want to observe, but usually you set that last option as nil. And this is roughly parallel to saying, hey, notification center, tell me when something happens. Great, now let's open up the project. Okay, now we're in Xcode. Let's uh, look up documentation for NS Notification Center. NS Notification Center is fairly straightforward. There's not all that much to it. There's the default center. This is a static method that gives you the singleton notification center. This is generally the center that you would be interested in. And there's a couple of ways of adding observers. This is the block-based method. It's a little more complicated and very few people use it. And here's the standard method. It basically lets you say, hey, notification center, tell this object, generally yourself, call this function on the observer when a notification occurs of this given name. And if you supply an object here, you can filter notifications so that you only get told when a certain notifier is the one that is broadcasting this notification. 
99% of the time you'll just leave this last one as nil. There are also other options for removing observers. It's important to re remove yourself as an observer when, a, when your instance goes out of memory. Otherwise, the notification center will still send notifications to your object after it has been deallocated and it is very easy to crash. Okay, let's hook up the notification in our app. So in our view did load, we want to listen for a notification. So we'll find the notification center, get the default center. All right, we'll be adding ourselves as the observer. The selector will be update time level. Even though this looks like a string, it is really the name of a function. I'm assuming in newer versions of Swift, eventually this will be this syntax will be tidied up. And the name we are listening for is this is the name of the notification. And as always, the notifier will be nil. Now to make sure our app never crashes, we should also heat hook the dinit method. And from the dinit method, we will remove ourselves as an observer. This will tell the notification center, stop sending notifications to this block of memory because I'm about to vacate said block of memory. Now you may be wondering why a name of a method is known as a selector. This harkens back to Swift's roots as Objective-C. Now in Objective-C, functions were also known as methods and methods had names and the name of a method was known as its selector. Now this is um, mainly for historical reasons. However, they still carry forward to this day. Now, a method in Swift that has no arguments, its, sel its selector will look like this. However, if it takes one argument, it will look like, like this. It will have a single colon. Again, this is from Objective-C that we get this reasoning. And if we have multiple arguments, such as say so we've got this function here that takes two arguments. The second argument and onwards are known as named arguments. The first argument doesn't get a name because its name is supposed to be part of the function name itself. However, second one and onwards are named arguments. And so the selector for it would be foo colon second arg and then another colon. And again, this just harkens back to Objective-C. Now, since we're not going to have an argument, I'll remove that colon and I will make the update time label function. And within the update time label function, I will create the formatter. I'll copy this code and put it in here. And on the initial appearance of the app, I will call that update time label method. Let's see how that goes. Here we can see it says 10.08 p.m. Let's see how long we've got to wait for that to tick over. Quite a wait. So firstly, I'll set a breakpoint on update time label. Go back to the simulator, move to the background, come to the foreground again, and as we can see, update time label is called automatically, which means our notifications are working perfectly. Command Shift H will move that to the background, and we will wait for the time to tick over to 10.09. Here we go. Function is called as it's expected 
and now it shows 1009. Fantastic. Let's try getting that selector wrong. I'll rename it subtly and run the app. We'll remove that breakpoint. I will do Command Shift H to move to the background and reforeground it. And now the app has crashed. I'll expand the debug area so we can see what's going on. And here's the error Unrecognized selector sent to an instance such and such. And it tried to send a method called update time lab le. Now, it tried to use a selector for a function that doesn't exist. So it tried to call update time label with the misspelling, and no such function exists, so it crashes. So I'll restore that, and that won't be a problem again. Now let's talk about the deinitializer a bit more. You know, in Swift and Objective-C before it, a form of memory management known as reference counting is used, and in newer versions, it has been known as automatic reference counting. Now, this is different to garbage collection, which is popular in most programming languages. In garbage collection, whenever an object is freed or unused, it is just left lying around in memory until a couple of seconds later, when the system will just go through, look for anything that isn't used by anyone, and throw it out. In other words, it goes through and throws out the garbage. Now, for iOS, this wasn't chosen to be a popular way to do things by the folks at Apple, because in garbage collected languages, it's quite common for apps to pause for a, for a brief while, while garbage collection happens. And they didn't really want this to happen, or it would ru ruin their smooth scrolling, especially on older versions of the iPhone. So instead they use reference counting. And the way reference counting works is every object has a number of references that are applied to it. And once its count of references goes to zero, that object is freed immediately. And just prior to its, it being freed, dnit is called. And dnit is where you get a chance to tidy up any memory that needs to be tidied up. In this case, we use that opportunity to tell the notification center, hey, stop sending notifications to me because this memory is about to become invalid. And so you can see that dnit plays a vital role in reference counting, which is Swift's way of handling memory in the most efficient way possible. One other thing we'd like to talk about, in the previous screencast, we were talking about handling methods from the app delegate. But if the app delegate was aware of how things worked on the clock view controller, that would violate separation of responsibilities. So, and it would also result in a bloated app delegate and just plain ugly code. So rather than making the app delegate have to be aware of how the clock works, we put all the logic for updating the clock in the clock view controller where it belongs. All right, thanks for watching. See you next time.